So you can't have an unbounded situation like near a finite point on the real line. If you have an unbounded situation, it's only as you go to plus infinity or, or minus infinity. Okay, so I wanted to point that out. So you see that um, when you have one of these closed intervals, such as C2 to C3, not only is the interval just simply a closed interval, ordinary closed interval, but actually the integrand is also bounded. And it's piecewise continuous on that interval. And here what I mean by piecewise is finite number of exception points. Remember, piecewise means discrete, but between two finite bounds, discrete means finite. Let me say that one more time. A discrete set only has a finite number of elements between any two finite bounds. So C2 and C3, for instance, are two finite bounds. And so a discrete set of discontinuity points would just be a finite set. So when I say piecewise continuous, I mean there's only a finite number of exceptions. So this integrand is a very nice integrand. It has only a finite number of discontinuity points, all coming from F, okay, in that interval. And the interval itself is also a very nice interval. It's just a closed interval. So there's no problem with these, interval, with these integrals. These integrals here are perfectly meaningful, finite. They're always finite except possibly at the two ends, right? There's, as long as n is between two, little n is between like two and big n, then you have these integrals, are, there's no question, they have to be finite. But at the two ends, here you have an unbounded region of integration from cn to plus infinity. And here also you have an unbounded region of integration. So there we can have an improper integral. And actually it could be improper in two ways. <clears throat> it's improper in two ways. Namely one is that the, inter the interval on which we're integrating is unbounded. But the other way is that f of x could approach plus infinity, right? Because as we said here, it's a very pathological case. We don't expect this to happen. Usually a density function will actually decay to zero. Typical density looks like this, where it decays to zero on both ends. That's a very typical case, but it doesn't have to happen. As I said, you can have this pathological situation where the uh, function f actually just climbs to plus infinity. So yeah, um, the integral can sort of be improper in, in two ways. But notice that it still converges simply because we're assuming that i1 overall converges. Like this entire integral here over the entire real line is assumed to converge. That's the main assumption. That's the main assumption that we started with here. Okay, so even those pieces are still convergent simply by assumption. So I'll, let me denote here that when little n is one, so that's the left-hand end, or when little n is big n plus one, which is the right-hand end, um, the improper integral converges right, by hypothesis, by assumption. You see, in all the other cases, it was clear that they, are, that they converge, because it's just an ordinary closed interval, and it's a piecewise continuous function on that, on that closed interval. So there was no question of convergence. But those two end pieces, where the interval of integration is unbounded, and the function f may also be unbounded, those, you know, <clears throat> we, need to, uh, we need to handle separately. But, but that's just still, still convergent, because the hypothesis is that this integral here is convergent overall. Okay, so that's good. Right, now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a change of variables. And um, so each of these little integrals in here, like each of these integrals in here is going to just be changed. Like we're going to make a, a u sub, essentially. So for for the ones in the middle, for these ones in the middle, there's not going to be any issue. Like the u sub will be perfectly will be perfectly okay. But the two ends could be an issue, and we have we have to be a little careful about those. Right, but let's let's work with the internal ones first, the interior ones. So let's say for little n between two and big n, where we just have a simple integral, where the it's a closed interval and it's a piecewise continuous integrand. Okay. The change of variables I want to make is I want to call this y. And we can invert that by writing x as phi n inverse of y, because we know that phi n is a one-to-one -one function, right? And then, um, this, so in this x, we're going to put that expression for x in there. And then we still have the dx we have to worry about. So dx is going to be the derivative of phi n inverse right, times dy. Okay. Now, when we make the u sub, so first of all, we, we should ask ourselves, like, is it okay to make a u sub in an integral like this, where both bounds are just finite numbers? Notice that the lower bound, like the lower limit of integration is certainly less than, because th those points were labeled in increasing order. So that's correct. Like the lower limit is a smaller number, and the upper limit is a larger number. But what about the integrand? What are the restrictions on the integrand that make a change of variables acceptable? Okay, well, this is something that they didn't really uh, talk about too precisely in calculus. But basically, just the integrand just has to be an integrable function. And then the change of variables has to be a, a nice change of variables. <clears throat> By a nice change of variables, I mean that the function that gives this substitution equation has to be like a continuously, continuously differentiable function in the interior. And that is the case for us. Phi n is indeed c1 in the interior of the interval, the open interval, in other words. We assume, we, we assume that for each piece. So you see that change of variables is a good change of variables. 
And the, the integrand is an integrable function. It's a Riemann integrable function because it's piecewise continuous. So it actually is acceptable to make this u sub. Okay, the only issue is, okay, so what do we get? Y, and we have, we have f of phi sub n inverse of y. And then the dx is going to become phi n inverse prime of y times dy. But the issue is the limits of integration. Those have to change too. And see, what they change into is like phi n inverse of cn minus 1 and then phi n inverse of cn. So that's, that's okay. But the problem is that we don't know which of those two is the smaller. So we, when we write the integral, we want to write the smaller limit as the lower limit and the larger as the upper limit. But we, we can fix things because we have just two cases. For the given piece, phi n, there are just two cases. It's either a green piece, which means it's like strictly increasing, or it's a red piece, which means it's strictly decreasing. And if it's a green piece, then its inverse function is also strictly increasing, which means that it's going to map the lower, like the smallest value in that interval to the smallest value in the corresponding interval. In other words, this is going to be the smaller number. So we're not going to change the limits. They're already in the correct order. Okay, and notice that this is also positive in that case, which means you can write it with, its, with an absolute value sign around it. Because it's a positive number, it's redundant. You can just put a redundant absolute value sign around it. Okay, and the limits of integration don't change because the smaller number, cn minus 1, Okay, right, and in the negative case, or in the decreasing case, rather, <clears throat> the inverse function is also decreasing. And so, um, in that case, this derivative will be negative. So if we insert the extra absolute value sign, we need also a minus sign to compensate for that. Right, because if the quantity in here is negative, then putting an absolute value sign around it is equivalent to putting an extra minus sign on it. So we need yet another minus sign to cancel out that extra minus sign so that we don't actually change anything. But you see, at the same time, in that case, this number here is going to be the larger. And this number here is going to be the smaller. <clears throat> and that's because, remember that cn minus 1 is the smaller of those two. But when you apply this decreasing function, the inequality is going to reverse. I don't have quite enough room to write it here, but you see that when you apply a decreasing function to an inequality, the inequality reverses. OK, so with all that said, <clears throat> in the end, we can write the integral in the following way. We can just take the minimum of those two values, whichever one is smaller as the lower limit, and we take the maximum of the two, whichever is bigger, as the upper limit of integration. Okay, and then we'll have a vector y. We'll have f of phi sub n inverse of y. And then we're going to have the absolute value of phi n inverse prime of y, dy. OK, and then if we just sum over all those values of n, that's going to take care of everything except the two ends, right, where we might have improper integrals. OK, well, actually, for now, why don't we just say for some fixed value of little n in this range, we uh, have now proven that this integral here that we started with can be expressed in this form. And because the original integral is finite, of course, that implies that this thing is also finite. OK, so for such values of n, there's no problem. It's just a straightforward change of variables. Now, we, we would also like to see that the exact same change of variables also works and yields the exact same result when little n is equal to 1 or capital N plus 1. In other words, in these two cases, where did I write it? Over here. Right? We have these two special cases, the two ends, where we have a pr an improper integral, which we know is convergent. But because it is improper, we have to just make sure that the change of variables actually works. So we're not used to that situation. When we make a change of variables, when we make a u substitution, we're only used to doing it in regular calculus, where like the integrals are just ordinary integrals. They're not improper. So we have to ask ourselves, like, to what degree, to what extent, does a u-substitution actually still work if the integral is improper? <clears throat> now, we don't have to answer that question in general. We just have to answer it in our situation. Okay. So let's take a look at the case of n equals 1, where we have the integral from c0 to c1 of this. And we know that this converges, because that's part of the main assumption that this entire integral converges. OK, so that's still in effect right now. Good, and remember that this c0 is actually minus infinity. So it's improper, like, but it's singly improper. And also the function can be expressed as phi1, because that's the piece of the function that um, extends between negative infinity and c1. OK, so it's a convergent integral. But, but the question is, can we still make the change of variables? Okay. So let's, let's take a look at it. We're going to write it as the limit, let's say, as a goes to minus infinity, of the integral from a to c1, where a is like less than c1. Okay. And uh, we still have the same integrand. 
Okay, now we can certainly make a u sub in this integral from a to c1, because that's just, you know, finite limits. So we have to carry the limit sign along. All right, and then like the same exact process that we did previously is going to yield the following thing. It's going to be the min, how did I write it earlier? Yeah, of like phi1 inverse of a and phi1 inverse of c1 up to the max. Of those same two things, right? And then we have y <clears throat> times, um, what was it, f of phi1 inverse of y, and then the absolute value of phi1 inverse prime of y. Let me give myself a little bit more room here. Sorry, that should have a prime in it. Okay, dy. So that, that's certainly valid. Okay, and the analysis from here will depend on whether we're, a phi1 is a green piece or whether phi1 is a red piece. Okay, so let's take a look. Um, two cases should be pretty similar. Right, let's look at the green, the green case, right? So in that case, um, phi1 is increasing and so is phi1 inverse. And since a is less than c1, that tells us that this minimum here is going to be just phi1. Let me write this in green to show that that's the case we're in, the green case. That's going to be phi1 inverse of a, and this maximum is going to be phi1 inverse of c1. Okay, and also this absolute value sign is unnecessary because the derivative is positive anyway. So in that case, we can make a u sub. Oh, sorry, the u sub is already done, right? Yeah, so in that case, we have, we have our u sub and it's uh, completely legitimate and it yields this expression. But the question is, what happens as a goes to minus infinity? Okay, so let's think about it. In the case of an increasing piece, now remember that we modified our definition of a nice function so that the two pieces on the ends are unbounded. So if, it, if the first piece is like an increasing piece, right? So as you move left to right, the function rises. <clears throat> it's a green piece. That's phi one, okay? But you see that because I'm assuming it doesn't have a horizontal asymptote, I'm assuming it's unbounded. So it, that piece is gonna go all the way to minus infinity as you move indefinitely far left. So if I have some a here, which is going to minus infinity, then you see that the value of the function at the point a, um, phi one, sorry, sorry guys, I realized I made a mistake here. Okay, I made a mistake way back here. Let me just fix it, it's easy to fix, I'm just tired. Um, these aren't inverses here, these are just phi sub m's, both of these. So it's phi sub m, Yeah, because um, cn minus one and cn are points on the x-axis, and we have to plug those into the, the function phi to get points on the y-axis, to get limits of integration for y. Um, or to say it differently, these limits here, um, like these are limits here, are x limits. These are limits on the x-axis. But to find the corresponding y limits, you have to use this substitution equation. So you take an x limit, such as cn minus one, and you just plug that in for x. And the resulting y limit is going to be phi sub n of c sub n minus one. That gives you this limit here. So it's not, it's not the inverse function, it's just the ordinary version of the function. So I have to delete all these inverses. Yeah, sorry about that. <clears throat> Okay, and the same thing, of course, holds here. That's going to be phi1 of a and then phi1 of c1. Okay, that's better. All right, and so, yeah, in the green case, uh, the smaller of the two is going to be phi1 of a because a is less than c1, and then the larger of the two is going to be phi1 of c1. Okay, anyway, yeah, um, back to this picture here. If we have some a on the x-axis, like smaller than c1, so you go to the function phi sub 1, and then you'll get the height. But notice that that height is going to minus infinity in this case. So this lower limit is going to minus infinity, as a goes to minus infinity also. And this is, again, because, remember, we assumed for our class of nice functions that it doesn't have horizontal asymptotes at the ends, it's unbounded at the ends. At both ends. Okay, so in that case, we're just going to have an improper integral. 
like after having taken the limit, after having taken this limit as a approaches negative infinity, this lower limit will have approached negative infinity. The upper limit doesn't depend on a. So you see, we're just going to get an improper integral in that case. And so our original integral is going to look something like this. Okay, as we want. <clears throat> right, and notice also that the um, limits of integration are in the correct order. Well, that was the green case. What if we were in the red case? So um, in that case, you see that the lower limit is actually going to be phi1 of c1. Because in the red case, this inequality is going to be reversed when we apply phi1, because phi1 is decreasing. So what, this wasn't even really relevant in the end. <clears throat> it was just phi1 was, was increasing. And therefore, when you take phi1 of both sides, you get a true inequality just like that. But because the red pieces are decreasing, when you take phi1 of both sides, it's actually going to reverse the inequality. So phi1 of c1 is going to be a lower limit in that case, in the red case. And then phi1 of a is going to be the, the upper limit in this case. Now, so what is happening, though, as a goes to minus infinity? All right, well, you have to analyze the picture. If that leftmost piece up to c1 happens to be a decreasing piece, and again, we're assuming it's unbounded, then being unbounded means it's going to go all the way up to plus infinity as you move left. So that means that if I put a here, and I look at the height of the function, phi1 of a, that's going to go now up to plus infinity, right? as a itself goes to negative infinity. So in the limit, what you're going to end up with is, let's distinguish the two cases. This happens in the green case, the increasing case. In the other case, you're going to end up with a plus infinity here, and a phi1 of c1 here. Right now, in both cases, these integrals are finite. These integrals converge because we know already that this limit, this thing as the limit, as a goes to minus infinity. This is finite, this converges to a finite value. That's true by the main assumption. So, you know, those other expressions are equal. They're also limits as a goes to minus infinity of equal expressions. So clearly those limits exist and are, are finite as well. Okay, but notice that actually both cases can also be written in the same way that we wrote the other cases, where we put the minimum of like phi1 of c0 this time, and phi1 of c1 on the bottom, <clears throat> and then put the maximum of the same two values on top. And then the integrand, of course, is the same in both cases. OK, why does this work? Well, look, c0, what does that mean? It means minus infinity, by definition. <clears throat> and phi1 of that is just taken to be the limit as you approach minus infinity. So. Um, Let me just write this here. The C0 is just negative infinity by definition. Okay, so there are two cases, right? In the green case, remember this picture here, the limit was minus infinity. So this thing here is actually minus infinity. So is this thing. Which means that the maximum of these two is this one, giving us the correct upper limit in that case. Because between negative infinity and some finite value, obviously negative infinity is the smaller of the two. So the maximum of the two is this. And the minimum of the two is this. Right, so you see the minimum, which is the lower limit, is, gives us back the correct lower limit. Right, but you see in the red case, a very similar thing happens. If you look at the picture, in the red case, you have to interpret phi of, or phi 1 of, minus infinity as plus infinity. And so in that case, this value here is going to, this value here will be plus infinity. So will that value. And between phi 1 of c1 and plus infinity, obviously plus infinity is the greater of the two. So the max becomes plus infinity, giving back the correct upper limit. And the min just becomes phi1 of c1, giving back the correct lower limit. Okay, so in both cases, we can express the formula in the exact same way that we expressed it in the finite case, in the ordinary case. Remember, this, this formula here, in this gray box, was the ultimate answer in the case where little n was between 2 and big N. So in other words, the, those intervals are the bounded ones, the, the, the closed intervals. But even on that very first interval, which is unbounded from c0 to c1, remember, from minus infinity to c1, that's an unbounded interval. But nevertheless, the answer can still be expressed in the same form as it was before. That is this form here. It's the exact same formula. It just has a slightly different interpretation because you, you're taking like the maximum between an infinite quantity and a finite quantity. And on the bottom, you're taking the minimum between an infinite quantity and a finite quantity. But we understand how to do that, right? We understand like, that minus infinity is less than any finite value, which is less than, than plus infinity. So we always know how to tell which is the min, which is the max. And in, every, in both cases, the green case and the red case, we get the correct formula. So and the answer, of course, is finite. As we know, in both cases, the answer is finite. OK, so yeah, we have a good formula here. Now, 
that's in the case where we have a function that's unbounded at both ends. What if I do have a horizontal asymptote, though? Remember, that's going to be okay. That should be okay as long as capital F doesn't have any bad points. As long as capital F is like continuously differentiable everywhere, then there was no reason to forbid the horizontal asymptote. So, you know, what would happen then? What would happen in that, in that picture? Okay, well, let's see. We can still look at this end from C0 up to C1. And let's assume that we have an increasing piece, but it has an asymptote. Okay, so as we move left to right, the function rises. That's the piece phi1. Okay, so like the improper integral still involves going from A to C1 and then letting A uh, move left. Right, so we, we integrate here in that direction from A to C1, but then we take the point A and we just let it move leftward toward minus infinity. Thing is, as that happens, phi1 of A doesn't go to minus infinity anymore, as it did in the original case. Rather, it approaches the height of that horizontal asymptote. Let me just call that height alpha. Right, so there's going to be this finite limit alpha as big A goes to negative infinity. So you see what's, what's going to happen then is that um, the limit as A goes to negative infinity of this integral is going to be the limit of this integral. Let's just, just deal with the green case. The, the red case has the limits flipped. Um, but okay, anyway, let's just deal with the green case just to illustrate. Okay, and um, what's happening here is that this thing is approaching alpha, and it's like approaching from above, as you can see, because as you move left, the function is like falling. So you're approaching alpha from, from above. Okay, well, that means that this limit process can be changed into an equivalent limit process, where we can just take the limit um, from some lower limit of integration, which let me call, I don't know, a, up to phi1 of c1. But now we're going to let a approach alpha from above. So that gives the exact same thing, because it doesn't matter that this lower limit happens to have this form. All that really matters is that the lower limit is approaching some value alpha from above. Okay, so this is an equivalent formulation of it. Okay, all the same stuff goes in here. Um, and you see, this is the very definition of this improper integral, where I just put alpha as the lower limit. This is now, this is an improper integral, same exact integrand, I'll just copy it. And remember, I'm only dealing with the green case right now. The, the red case has the limits flipped. But anyway, you see that this is, this is by definition what we mean, because this function is improper at, at this limit. The, the integrand here is improper at this limit, alpha. Uh, why is that? All right, well, it's because y like, never really reaches alpha. So this expression doesn't make sense when y is exactly alpha. Phi1 inverse of alpha doesn't, doesn't exist. And you can see why in the picture. Um, here's phi1. If I ask for phi1 inverse of alpha, what that means I'm asking for is a point on the x-axis where the height of the function phi1 is exactly alpha. But you see that there is no such point. The heights of phi1 are just approaching alpha. They're never exactly equal to alpha. So there is no such point x where phi1 of that point is exactly of height alpha. It just doesn't exist. So when y is exactly the equal to the lower limit, the, this function here just doesn't have a meaning. This expression in particular is meaningless. It's, all, it's meaningful for values of y a little bit greater than alpha. See, as long as y is a little bit greater than alpha, and up to and including phi1 of c1. So you see that it's an improper integral at that end. But the meaning of an improper integral is the limit, is this limit here. And that limit exists, we know already, because we know that its value is this. And that, that limit also exists just by the main assumption. That, that limit is just nothing but, you know, this thing, which we know exists by the key assumption. It's just some finite real number. Okay, so everything is finite here. All, all these limits are identical. So yeah, this limit here exists and is finite. So we can write that as, as this improper integral if we so choose. Okay, so, you know, even in the um, case of a horizontal asymptote, it's, it's perfectly okay. Uh, but then the question becomes, can we write the formula in the same way that we wrote the other two cases, where we have like the minimum of something and the maximum. Well, let's see, what would it be? Remember, there was supposed to be phi1 of c0 and phi1 of c1. Now, phi1 of c1 is just an ordinary finite number. Okay, same integrand, so I won't bother rewriting it. But, but the question is, what do we make of this? Because remember that when c0, c0 is minus infinity. So, it, you know, phi1 doesn't really have a value there at minus infinity, but, but you see then, it's clear what to do in that case. You just define that value to be alpha, by definition. And then, then you can ask, like, between alpha and phi1 of c1, which is the greater? And you can see that in the green case that we analyzed, phi1 of c1, which is this height, 
is the greater between these two. So the maximum of the two is going to be this upper limit, which we got correct. And the minimum of the two, between these two that is, is going to be this lower limit. So it actually is correct even in that case. Now that, that only covers the green case, but the red case works out very similarly. So in the end, the exact same formula holds as long as we define things correctly. Like we, we're going to define, as we normally do, phi 1 at minus infinity to just be the limit of phi 1 of a as a goes to minus infinity. And if there's a horizontal asymptote, then that height is the asymptote's height. So with that definition in place, actually the same formula holds in all the cases. Remember, in the, in the ordinary case, where there were no improper integrals, we got this formula here, down here in the gray box. Okay, In the case where we had function phi that was unbounded at both ends, we got the correct same exact formula here in this gray box. It's exactly the same formula as, it, as in the preceding gray box. And then again, in the case where you have a, an asymptote, um, you get the exact same formula. And in all cases, the, the answer is finite and makes perfect sense. And it's expressed by the exact same formula. Okay, so now we're almost done. But um, what comes next is a little bit tricky. But that's going to be the end of it. This is basically the last, the last step in the argument coming up now. So now that I know that my formula in the gray box holds for every single n, I can just sum over all the values of n. That covers all the, all the intervals. Now remember that the um, improper integral over the entire real line of phi of x times f of x could be broken up as the sum of all these pieces. because those pieces are pairwise disjunct intervals whose union is the entire real line. Okay. And then we also found that in each case, regardless of the value of little n, whether little n was between 2 and big N, or whether it was 1, or whether it was n plus 1, in all cases, we found that um, the integral here could be changed, you can make a change of variables, and the answer was always the same. It's like the min of phi 1 of cn minus 1 and phi 1 of cn up to the max of those same two values. And then what we're integrating is y times f of phi n inverse of y times absolute value of phi n inverse prime dy. Okay, good. Now, to make further progress, we need to do one more thing. Okay, we, so we have to realize that these, these intervals of integration that we have right now, th those are nothing but the ranges of... Um, so, let me just draw a little picture. Yeah, in fact, I'm, I'll write it that way first, and then I'll draw you the picture. So what we're really doing is we're, like, we're letting y run through j sub n, which is the range, remember, of the nth piece. And when I say run through, what I mean is in the increasing direction, always. If I write an integral this way with this notation, if I write an integral this way, what I mean to imply is that a is less than b, and we're just integrating in the natural direction. So with that understanding, I can write it this way, and it's the same integrand. So writing it that way is a little more elegant, obviously. But you see, that, that's correct simply because um, this minimum here and this maximum here are exactly the two endpoints of that, of that range. Okay, why is that? Well, if I take a typical interval, cn minus 1 to cn, and I have some piece of the function, let's say it happens to be a red piece, the range of that piece is just, because it's a strictly decreasing function, the range is just going to be exactly this closed interval. And notice that this height here is just... If this piece is phi n, then this is going to be phi n of cn minus 1, and this is going to be phi n of cn. So those are exactly the two endpoints of the range. But, if, but I have to write them in the, in the correct order, because I want to make the limits of integration like in their natural order, increasing. So I have to, I have to take the minimum of the two and make that the lower limit, and take the maximum of the two and make it the upper limit. Okay? But it's always correct to write this now. When I say always correct, so you have to understand that in the case of these like, closed intervals, if I have a closed interval, that's fine. It's perfect. But there's also those other cases where at the two ends, like you can have this situation where let's say you have you know, a green piece like this, and if it's unbounded, then the range of that piece is actually like this unbounded interval. That would be the, the jn plus 1. Okay, so what are its limits? Okay, well, this limit here would be phi n plus 1 of cn, because you know, that's the point you're plugging in. And then what's the upper limit? Well, the upper limit is plus infinity, but you can think of that as phi n plus 1 of plus infinity again, because right, as you move to plus infinity, the function goes to plus infinity. That's expressed by this equation. And then you can also express that in the form cn plus 1, because remember, cn plus 1 is nothing but plus infinity by definition. So you, you, still can, you can still express the limits in the correct way. Okay? In all cases, we can still express the limits in exactly that same, that same way. So this is, yeah, this is a correct statement here. We can replace the integral by that. All right, here's the problem. The problem is that these pieces don't fit together very nicely, the, the sum, I mean, because the j sub n's are not disjunct. The j sub n's overlap. That's a problem. Right? Remember that on the y-axis, 
So the, the, these intervals are disjunct. Here's like two typical ones, which like share a common endpoint. But you see the range of this piece here, um, phi n, and then the range of the next piece, let's say it looks like that, they are not disjoint or even disjunct. One of those ranges is this closed interval, and the other range is like this closed interval here. And they obviously overlap uh, non-trivially. Okay? So we have like the, the y-axis kind of chopped up into pieces here, but the pieces are not disjunct. So summing over them is not convenient. It's only convenient to sum over like a decomposition of the y-axis into disjunct pieces, because then we can interpret that as just an improper integral over the entire y-axis. But the way things stand right now, we can't do that. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're just going to chop up those j sub n's into smaller pieces that are disjunct. See, the next step in the argument and the final step is going to be, we're just going to chop up all the j sub n's into these even smaller pieces, which we're going to call i sub k's. And this will be i sub k plus 1, and so on. Down here you'll have maybe some i k minus 1. And you can have lots of these, but there's only going to be a finite number of them. Okay, so by chopping up, and, and then notice, by the way, that this green range, this green thing, which is j uh, n plus 1, can be expressed exactly as a union of certain i's. Like it's i k union i k plus 1. It's just exactly those two i's. And those two i's are disjunct. But at the same time, if you look at this red range, which is uh, capital J sub n, you can also express that as a union of certain ones of these. Namely, it's just i k itself. Okay. So that's what the plan is to sort of chop up the y-axis into disjunct pieces. The i sub k's are going to be pairwise disjunct pieces. And then the ranges, these j sub n plus, or j sub n's or whatever, are going to partake in those i sub k's, a certain number of them. Each jn is going to involve a certain number of i sub k's. This one only has one. This one involves two of them. Okay? But that's going to give us a subdivision of the y-axis that we can work with. So that's the, the final step in the argument. And let's like, work out the details now. Okay, so the analysis goes like this. The j's are certain closed intervals, which are possibly overlapping. And some of them, well, two of them precisely, might be unbounded. So say the picture looks like this. Let's say that's j1 and that's j n plus 1, the unbounded ones. And maybe, um, well, okay, this is not the most accurate picture in the world, because you'll notice that two consecutive ranges have a shared endpoint because of this point here. So, okay, I'm not drawing the most accurate picture in the world here, but, yeah, roughly speaking, you know, to make it a little more accurate, maybe I'll just do something like this. Like j1 and j2 have a shared endpoint, right? Um, j2 and j3 are going to have a shared endpoint and so on. But you'll notice that there's only a finite number of points that are, that are endpoints of any of these intervals. Because there's only a finite number of those intervals in the first place. There's exactly n plus 1 of them. So each one has two endpoints, and so there's at most 2 times n plus 1 points that you know, can be endpoints. Now, a finite collection of points on the real line, this is, this is representing the y-axis here. Any finite collection of points on the y-axis can be ordered in increasing order. So we can label these points in increasing order. I'm not going to bother doing that, because I don't want to introduce notations for that. But the point is that we can then form these intervals, like from minus infinity to that first point is going to be i1. From the first point to the second point will be i2. From the second to the third will be i3. Third to the fourth will be i4, and so on. So you see some of these might be quite short. Uh, and then the last one will be unbounded. You see that i sub 1, the very first one, is unbounded. And then, in this case, it's i12. But in general, you'll have some finite collection. And the last one will be unbounded as well. Right? OK, so as I said, the uh, key property of this subdivision is that, on the one hand, the i sub k's, as k varies, let's say up to capital K, it's just a finite collection. But these are pairwise disjunct um, with union. OK, actually, so there's a slight, slight mistake here. The picture that I've drawn here only applies in the case where phi is unbounded at both ends. Let's focus on that case. <clears throat> in other words, there's no horizontal asymptote at either end. The graph of the function is unbounded at both ends, because that means that <coughs> the range of j1 is unbounded, and also jn minus 1. Okay, now, e actually, even in that case, um, the picture doesn't really have to look like this, because both ends might be increasing to plus infinity. You know, the function could look, could look something like that, whatever. So the, they may both be unbounded in the same direction. So the, the best I can really say, in general, if I'm not in any special case, is that the union of all these i sub k's 
is some set capital I, which happens to be an interval. But it may not be the entire real line. Okay, so what, what's going to happen ultimately is that like the, the variable y is going to run through this set. But now the variable y is really supposed to run through the entire real line. So we're going to have to worry a little bit at the end about what happens outside of this interval. But it's going gonna, it's gonna to work out fine. Outside of this interval, basically the integrand is going to be zero. So the, the um, pieces of the real line outside of that interval are going to just turn out to make no contribution to the, to the integral. Okay, so we'll, we'll see that in a little while. But then also each jn, each of those ranges of the pieces, is the union of a certain selection of I sub k's. <clears throat> right? So for example, if you look in this picture, J2 is the union of I3, I4, I5, I6, and I7. And it's exactly, it's like exactly that union. Okay, so anyway, that's um, the system of integrals. And what we can do with, with our formula, <clears throat> where we left off last was here, this formula. What I'm going to do is just write the integral over J sub n as the sum of integrals over i k's, where I sum over all k for which i k is inside j n. Okay, so why that, why that works is because the interval j n is cut up into a bunch of pieces, which are, let's say, i k, i k plus 1, whatever, right, i k plus 2. But it's only those i's that are inside j n. It's exactly those intervals i which are fully contained within j n that we include. And those are disjunct pieces. These are pairwise disjunct pieces with a union equal to jn, exactly. So therefore, the integral over jn itself can just be broken up. You just integrate over this piece, then you integrate over that piece, then you integrate over that piece, and you add up the results. And you see that that's equivalent to just integrating over the entire j sub n itself. So it's legitimate to replace this integral sign here by this summation of integrals. <clears throat> and that's the next step in the calculation. Okay, so what I have is the sum over n. And then I'm going to have the sum over all k, for which i sub k is inside j sub n. And then the integral over i k, well, as y runs through i k, like in the increasing direction. And then it's the integrand. Notice that the integrand involves phi sub n inverse of y. Okay, now in this nested sum, we have this nested summation where we fix an n first. Right, and then given that n, we take all k, for which this condition is satisfied. All right, but notice that this condition is just a condition involving k and n. Right, this condition just exactly involves two variables, k and n. But we're fixing an n first in a, in a certain range. There's only a finite number of, of n values that are relevant, and also only a finite number of k values that are relevant. I called it 1 to capital K, whatever. But <clears throat> um, given like a fixed value of n, we then asked for all k in this set that satisfied this condition. All right, now that, that process can be nested the other way around. We can fix a value of k first, and then ask for all values of n that satisfy the same condition, given that k. That's an equivalent summation process. It's just a different way of organizing the same like double summation process. All right, now the, the advantage in having done that is that now this summation can be moved inside the integral. <clears throat> because you see that You see that um, this first summation sign involves fixing a k. We fix some k in this range. And then given that fixed k, we have certain values of n that work, right? Certain, certain values of n that satisfy this relationship with that given k. But you see that this y is just running through that fixed interval. What this variable y, which is the dummy variable of integration, runs through a fixed interval, namely i sub k. And that's because k itself is fixed in this step. If k were able to change, then, you know, the y would be running through two different intervals. Let's say k jumped to k plus 1. Then y would first be running through i sub k and then i sub k plus 1. But here we just have the variable of integration running through some fixed interval that, that is independent of these n values. That's the key, is that the interval of integration here is completely independent of this set of n values over which we're summing. That set, okay, that, that set of n values, let's call it s sub k, it's the set of all values of n, you know, between 1 and, and big n plus 1, for which... This condition is true. So, but that set depends on k. But, you know, k is fixed, so therefore this set is also fixed. Since k is fixed, this set sk is fixed. 
So we have a sum just over some fixed index set. And then we have an integral over some fixed interval, the interval being I sub k itself. Okay, and now a finite sum, right? This is a sum over some finite index set, namely S sub k. So that's really what's going on. It's like N is running through some fixed and finite set, S sub k. Well, a finite summation can always be moved <clears throat> inside an integral sign. All the integrals involved are perfectly finite convergent integrals, and it's a finite summation, so there's no issue about convergence <clears throat> with that summation sign there. So yeah, this summation can be rewritten this way. Okay, so you see, because the k is fixed in the first step, in the first summation, the outermost summation, then the sk, which is the set of n values, becomes a fixed, unchanging set for that given k. And also the interval over which y runs is some fixed, unchanging interval, given that k. And then it becomes valid to move the summation sign inside the integral sign. Now when we do that, <clears throat> here's what we get. The integral sign is here now. We're having this sum. Okay, and then notice also that the factor y can be taken out. And we just leave all the other stuff in inside the summation. And then we have a dy. The reason that the factor y can be taken out is simply because it doesn't depend on n. And n is the index of summation here. n is like the index or dummy variable of summation. Okay, now n doesn't run through the full set. It, it only runs through the set sk, which is the set of n values for which that relationship holds. But anyway, n is running through some set, some index set. So, so it's the n that's like the index of summation. Now, anything inside here that depends on n cannot be moved out. But y does not depend on n. y is completely independent of n. The only thing it depends on is k, because it's running through that interval. So you know, the location of y is going to depend on k, because it's stuck in the kth interval. But it's totally independent of n. So therefore, it's valid to take that factor of y like from inside the summation to outside the summation. Okay. Now, let me just copy over what we've got so far. OK, and also, by the way, the, um, one more thing we can now do quite nicely is that this process here can be replaced by the integral as y runs through i, where i, remember, is the union of those i sub k, all of them. I think I wrote that here, yeah. Take the union of all of those pieces and write that as capital I. Now, that could be the entire real line, like it is in this picture, but it doesn't have to be. But you see that this is correct to replace this summation and this integral with this single integral because the interval i is just cut up into all those pieces. And the pieces are pairwise disjunct. So instead of integrating all at once over i, we can just integrate over each little piece and then add up the results. So that, that converts the expression into the integral as y runs over i of y times sum over all n for which this condition holds, and then this expression. Let me just move the dy out a little and put big square brackets around that. <clears throat> okay, sorry guys, I jumped the gun a bit. I um, tried to do too many things all at once. Let me let me slow down a bit. Let me keep this here. Okay, you see that actually the k is still appearing here, right? K appears there in this condition, so I can't quite get rid of the summation sign over k uh, just yet. So now I have to change this condition. I have to rephrase that condition so that it doesn't involve k anymore. All right, so let's think about this for a second. Okay, so for purely technical reasons, which I'll explain in a moment, I have to begin by writing the integral in this way. Instead of, instead of letting y run through this entire interval, I have to let it run through this interval that I'm going to call i sub k epsilon. And what I mean by that is the following thing. Let's say i sub k is this closed interval, and I'll just call its endpoints a sub k and b sub k. So what I mean by i sub k epsilon is that you shrink the interval by um, adding epsilon to the left endpoint and then subtracting epsilon from the right endpoint. So I'm shrinking it by a length of 2 epsilon, going from here to here now. Okay. Where this distance is epsilon and also that distance. Okay, anyway, so um, and then, then when you take the limit, right, as epsilon goes to 0 from above, you're going to get the same thing as you had before. What goes inside here is still still the same. It's y times this expression. And then there's a dy, which I don't have quite enough room to write, but I'll just write it like that. 
right? Um, also, we have to understand that two of those I sub k's could be could possibly be unbounded, like the very first one and the very last one. Could be. They don't have to be, but they could be unbounded. And in that case, you have to understand that, say, if bk is, let's say, plus infinity, then when you subtract epsilon from that, you still get plus infinity. So that limit doesn't actually change. Okay? And if the lower limit happens to be negative infinity, when you add epsilon to that, it doesn't actually change either. So with that understanding, like, these things don't have to be, but they could be. Um, it's certainly correct to replace the integral over the entire I sub k by this limit. Okay, that's, it's always going to be true, simply because the integrand is a bounded function on those intervals. Um, and if it's not, then the integral is improper, and it's just defined by that limit. So in other, in other words, what I'm saying is, in the case of bounded intervals, like when the I sub k's are bounded, then the integrand here is just a bounded function on that interval. And then, uh, you know, as the endpoints as the endpoints of this smaller interval move out to approach their limits, you're going to get the correct formula. You're, you're going to get the correct limits of integration, just by the essentially by the continuity. When you, when you create a function by integrating something bounded, like the resulting function is continuous. Um, what am I saying there? If I, if I create a function by integrating something up to x, where the something is you know, piecewise continuous, the resulting function of x is continuous. And so as x approaches a limit, you're going to get the correct value. If I take the limit as x approaches something, a, I'm just going to get the correct value. So you see that it's correct to, to make that replacement. And in the case when i sub k is unbounded, then the integral on, on i sub k is an improper integral anyway. But the same continuity argument is going to hold at that end. So, like for example, let's say i k looks like this, where a sub k is here. Okay. So then, what I'm doing is I'm taking a sub k plus epsilon, and as I let epsilon go to zero from above, I can still use the continuity at that end. So just don't use the continuity at the other end, because that that end is plus infinity and it doesn't change, as we said right here. Okay. So it's basically a continuity argument that allows us. Now, why would we want to do this? That's a separate question. Why would I want to bother making the expression more complicated? Here I have a nice simple integral. And here I've replaced that by a limit of integrals. So why would I want to do that? All right, so you'll, you'll see that the justification for this is going to come in the next step. But in the meanwhile, this is certainly a valid thing to do. OK, now here, here's the key. The key part of the argument is I now wish to replace this condition by something that doesn't involve k, but is ne nevertheless equivalent. All right. So let's think about it very carefully. In the context of this integral, in the context of this integration here, the variable y is just a dummy variable, which stands for some point of this interval, which notice is in the interior of the original interval, i sub k. So if I, in other words, if I have a point y, right, that's in this interval here, i sub k epsilon, that is an interior point of the original i sub k. Now, of course, that means it's inside i sub k. But more, more, more importantly, it's like interior to it. All right, why, why does that matter? Well, let's think about this. What values of n, exactly what values of n, satisfy this condition? To answer that, let's look at a picture. Remember that our j sub n's can be overlapping. Without trying to be too detailed about it, let's picture the j sub n's like this. And then the i sub k's are these pieces that are pairwise disjunct. Okay, and so let's like, take a typical i sub k, and we're going to look at point y that's in the interior of that. So it's not an endpoint. And then we ask, like, which values of n are such that i sub k is inside j sub n? This k is fixed here. k is like chosen in advance and fixed, and so we're just looking at this fixed interval. And we also have a fixed point y in the interior of that interval. Okay, so both of those are fixed. And we're asking then, you know, which n satisfy, which, which subscripts n satisfy this condition here. Okay, well, you can see in the picture that um, that interval i sub k is inside j1, so n equals 1 works. It's also inside j2 and j3. And it's not in any of the others, right? Like, let's say this is j4, this is j5. And maybe for good measure, let's have a j6, whatever. Okay, so it's not in any of the others. So that's going to be the set sk for this particular k, just the set of all n values that satisfy that condition. Okay, but at the same time, I claim that those are the, that's the same set, and this is the, the key claim here, so let me write it as such. I claim that you can also think of that as the set of n values for which y belongs to j sub n, where y is given. This y is like this fixed given value. Now let's think about that. If you look at the picture, y is this point here, right? 
well, which n values are such that that point is in J sub n. You can see that in the picture, that point, that green point, belongs to J1, J2, and J3. And notice that it doesn't belong to J5, even though J5 and J1 share an endpoint. You see that this point here is a shared endpoint between J1 and J5. The reason it's not in J5 is because it's not equal to, that green point is not equal to the endpoint, that shared endpoint, because it's in the interior. That's the reason why we did this little shrinking, the shrinking process here, is to make sure that the Y value that we pick is not going to be one of these endpoints. Okay, so, yeah, so therefore the Y value that we picked being inside this particular I sub K, what, which, which of the J's are, is that Y value inside, the green point? Well, it's inside exactly those J's that I sub K is a part of. See, I sub K is a part of J1, I sub K is also a part of J2, and I sub K is a part of J3. But I sub K is not contained in J5. And so exactly those J's that I sub K is a part of are exactly those J's that Y belongs to. Y belongs to those very same J's. See, that wouldn't be true if we allowed Y to be an endpoint. Because if this were my point Y, this shared endpoint, that would belong to J5 as well. But you see that IK is not in J5, not part of J5. So if Y belonged to it, then you would have a, a difference between this set of n values here and this original set of n values. Remember, the original set of n values, SK, by definition, was a set of n values that satisfied this condition. So you'd have, you'd have a difference between these two sets. Like this set would be, in our, in our picture, 1, 2, 3, and this set would be 1, 2, 3, 5. They wouldn't be the same set if this, you know, if you allow this. But because we don't allow that, right, we don't allow y to be an endpoint. We take y to only be an interior point. And we can do that because we've shrunken the interval now. So that if y is in this new interval, like this smaller one here, then it's actually automatically in the interior of the original one. That was, that's really the reason for um, replacing what, after all, is a perfectly simple integration with something that looks more complicated. Just temporarily, we need to do that. We need to do it so that we can replace this condition down here with something equivalent. Now, namely, remember, I just, we just showed, well, we did it in a special picture, but the ideas are very general. I, I drew this special picture just to illustrate the situation, but the ideas in this proof are, are totally general. What we just proved is that the set of n for which this condition is true, ik is inside jn, is exactly the same as the set of n for which y belongs to jn. And this is where y is some fixed point in the interior of ik. Both are given, like k is given and y is given, and they have this relationship. So that means that the values n for which this condition holds, which was the condition under the summation sign, is just equivalent to the following condition on n. <clears throat> and you see this condition here doesn't involve k. This condition is now independent of k. So we can write our result by continuing this calculation. <coughs> we had this sum. And then we had, um, <clears throat> oh, I don't even remember anymore. Yeah, <coughs> the limit sign as epsilon goes to zero. Then you have the integral as y runs through this slightly shrunken interval, i sub k epsilon. And then remember the summation sign. Well, there's the factor of y, and then you have the summation sign. But now I'm going to write the summation sign with this condition, which is equivalent. Oops. Like this, OK? That's the whole like integrand, and then you have a dy <coughs> at the very end. OK, well, now uh, notice that this expression here in the square brackets, well, you have the factor of y, but the rest of it is nothing but g of y. Let me just go back uh, a little while and show you that. Where was it? Here, here we go. You see, this is exactly the expression right here. It's the sum over all n for which y is in jn. And then you have this thing here where you have f of phi, inver phi sub n inverse of y, and then you have the absolute value of phi n inverse prime of y. So notice the condition here that we're summing over. All values of n that satisfy that condition, y belongs to jn. Okay, now that's that's not exactly the function g of y, but it's Riemann equivalent to it. So it's inside an integral, the two give the same results. Okay, so coming back now, what we have left is sum over k limit as epsilon goes to zero, uh, integral as y runs through i sub k epsilon, and then y times g of y dy. Okay. Now, I want to be able to say that this is just 
the integral as y runs through the complete i sub k of y times g of y. And once I can do that, let me just mark this with a question mark just temporarily, then um, I'm going to just get y running through the entire capital I. Where remember that capital I was defined as the union of, of those I sub k's. And these I sub k's are disjunct. They're just disjunct closed intervals. So their union is just I. All right, now that's not exactly what we're expecting to see, because we're actually expecting to see this. But actually, the two, these two really are equal. And let, let me just, before coming back to this question, let me just explain why these two are equal. That's actually very easy. It's simply true because, like, the fact that these two are equal is true because it turns out that g of y is identically zero for y outside of capital I, if y is not in capital I. So you see, the rest of the real line makes no contribution because the integrand is going to be identically zero outside of, of capital I. So we have just the part of the integral inside capital I, and then the rest of the integral is just the integral of zero over the entire rest of the real line. All right, now, how, how do I know? All right, if you look at the formula for g of y, which is this. Let me mark that in yellow. At least g of y like, is Riemann equivalent to that. It's not exactly that, but it's Riemann equivalent to it. So um, we can the fact that it's Riemann equivalent means that you can replace g of y by, by that expression with no change because it's under an integral sign with respect to y. So, you know, g of y, okay, so I, I sort of said something slightly wrong. You see, g of y doesn't necessarily have to be identically zero itself because g of y, remember, is you can subject it to any change you like on a discrete set because density is not unique. But what I'm saying here is that like, by changing g at a discrete set of points, we can make it have the property that it's identically zero outside of i. We can always choose the density g by, by changing the one we have at a discrete set of points such that it becomes it becomes true that it's identically zero outside of the of the interval i. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so why? Here's why. It's because if y is outside of i, what that means is that y does not belong to any of the i k's for any k. And that implies that y does not belong to any of the jn's for any n. Because remember that the jn's are just decomposed into those pieces, the i sub k's. So if y doesn't belong to any of the i sub k's at all, then it also doesn't belong to any of the jn's either. Now, what does that tell you? It tells you that this condition here is empty. The set of n for which this is satisfied is the empty set in that case. Because y does not belong to any of the jn's. So if that's the empty set, then you're summing over the empty set. And by convention, a sum of which is empty, like it's a sum of no terms at all, is just equal to zero by, by definition. So empty sum. The convention is that that's equal to zero by definition. OK? And so that means that the, this whole expression, the summation sign expression that I've overlined in yellow, is going to be identically zero for all y outside of uh, capital I. OK? And since that's Riemann equivalent to g of y, we can just change g of y to that function. And so, yeah, with that understanding, uh, this is a correct jump from here to here. The only question remaining is this one. Is, you know, can I just take away this limit sign and take away this epsilon here and write it this way? Okay. And so that's going to depend on the properties of this function. Oh, by the way, uh, I should really mark this down before I go any further. So the step we're trying to answer right now is this jump. Like, why is that valid to like delete the limit sign? Um, but I should also just make sure I keep I have on record like this jump here. Why is that jump valid? And that's just simply because the um, the i sub k's are disjunct, and their union is is capital I. But it's very important that the pieces are disjunct. The i sub k's are pairwise disjunct. So that's a, a crucial part of the argument in, in this step um, <clears throat> that I marked in green. In other words, changing this into this single integration sign. OK, anyway, so uh, what about this question? So yeah, it's going to depend on, on the properties of this, this integrand. Um, in particular, it's going to depend on the properties like near the original endpoints. Basically, this function has to be bounded. Um, not, it doesn't have to be bounded everywhere. It just has to be bounded on like compact sets, compact subsets of the reals. So if I take some very large closed interval, for example, then I want that function to be bounded on that large closed interval. If I take a, a bigger closed interval, then it's going to be bounded on that too, but the, the bound may be much larger. So in other words, it could tend to infinity at the ends. Like the g of y could tend to infinity or minus infinity at the, at the ends, as y gets very large, positive or negative. But on any bounded portion of the real line, the function itself should be bounded. Then it's going to be true that this limit is equal to this integral because of this continuity phenomenon that I mentioned, where if you integrate up to something and then you let that something approach something else, this integral is going to approach that. It's just a property of integrals, continuity property. And it's, it's true as long as the integrand is reasonable, as long as the integrand is, let's say, piecewise continuous. So you see, that's what's happening here, is that the two endpoints of this integral are approaching the two endpoints of this integral. So by continuity, the value of the integral should approach the value of the other integral as, um, as epsilon goes to zero. 
All right, but do I know that? Is this function really bounded? Okay, so there we have a problem. There we, we have a slight problem, which is that, okay, this piece is certainly bounded. Because remember that although little f could tend to infinity, that's a, that, that's a very pathological picture. It's pathological in that it doesn't happen in practice, but it, it can happen, right? Where like little f could, could, ha could go to infinity as you move out to infinity. But at least on any finite portion, bounded portion of the real line, on compact sets, in other words, then f will be bounded. So the little f is no problem. That's going to be bounded on any compact uh, portion of the real line. The real problem is this term here. Because remember, this can, this can go to infinity. Remember that uh, in the very simple case of x squared, basically the simplest case you could think of, other than, let's say, just a strictly increasing function, the um, increasing piece, when you look at its inverse, at the end point, 0, the slope goes infinite. So you see, this is phi 1 inverse. And when we look at phi 1 inverse prime, that actually approaches infinity at, at the end point. So you know, as epsilon goes to 0, um, this endpoint here might approach that fixed endpoint. And at that fixed endpoint, the function g of y, or whatever this function here, which is Riemann equivalent to g of y, might have a factor in it that blows up to infinity, or whatever, or minus infinity. So yeah, um, how do we avoid that? OK, well, OK, so the answer is we don't actually need this condition. That's usually what we would need, but we don't in this case, and I'll tell you why. Reason is because we already know that this integral here on the full interval converges as an improper integral in the case when the integrand does blow up. So imagine that this integrand blows up at one of the endpoints. That would happen in a case like this where this derivative here blows up to infinity at one of the endpoints. Now, it can only happen at an endpoint. That's, that's really the key. It can only happen at an endpoint, as it does here in this, in this case, where this happens at, the, at this endpoint of the interval j1. And that's just by the inverse function theorem. Remember that um, by the inverse function theorem, phi n inverse has a derivative, which is continuous and certainly finite for all y in the interior. So if it's going to blow up at all, it, it has to blow up at an endpoint. So let's say this thing, the derivative, let's say goes to plus infinity or could go to minus infinity. But it would have to be as y is approaching one of the two endpoints of Jn. OK? Um, so what's the relevance of that? Well, the relevance is that even though the integrand is blowing up at one of the endpoints, so therefore this whole thing is an improper integral, but we know it converges already. It's known to converge. The reason it's known to converge is because we know that all of the, these integrals are finite. In the original expression here, before we did this shrinking process, let me just go back to a step just before we did that shrinking process, right? All of these integrals here are known to converge. This is our function g of y, or at least we can change g of y to be this function, and it's Riemann equivalent. So yeah, this integral here is known to converge, right? Because after all, certain sums of those intervals give us back, sorry, certain sums of those integrals, I should say, give us back these integrals here. And these are known to converge. How do, how do we know they converge? Because we know that they're equal to these by um, u substitution. And these are all known to converge. So therefore, these are all known to converge as well. So we, we went through all the cases and proved carefully that you know, every one of these integrals is finite, uh, or, or it's an improper integral that's convergent. That's by the main assumption. But that's going to imply, after doing the u substitution, that this new integral is also convergent. Okay, and then that integral got split into pieces. That integral got split into all of these pieces, where we're integrating just over i sub k. So you see that these integrals here over just i sub k are finite. Every one of these integrals in this summation yields a finite value. OK, so what does that matter? Why does it matter that um, in the case where, let's say, this g of y happens to blow up at one of the two endpoints, blow up to infinity, the, it, the, the improper integral of it on the full i k is convergent. It's known to converge. Why does that matter? Well, why it matters is that if you have a function that blows up at one of the two ends of an interval, or it could, could do it at both ends, really. But let's say I have such a function whose graph blows up to infinity. Okay? But I know that the integral converges as an improper integral. What that means is that if I take the integral from, let's say, this point to this point, and I let, let's say, a approach alpha from above, and I let b approach beta from below, and you look at the integral from a to b, the convergence of this integral just means that this has a limit at right? the integral of my function um, 
as these two limit processes take place, exists and is finite. That's what the um, existence of this improper integral would mean. And then this improper integral is just exactly that limit. Okay, you can write this, um, by the way, as like the sum of two different limits if you split the, in the integration at some third point. So don't be um, put off by the fact that I have these two conditions under the same limit sign. That's really just an abbreviation where you take the limit first as a goes to alpha from below, and you just integrate from a to c. Then you'll integrate from c to b, and you'll take the limit of that as b goes to beta from below. I said, okay. And then you just add those two. So this here is just an abbreviation for that. Anyway, so how does that, why does that matter for us? Okay, well, notice that that is exactly what was going on with the shrinking process. The shrinking process was some smaller interval inside our bigger interval. And as epsilon went to zero, this endpoint went to that endpoint alpha, and this endpoint went to that endpoint beta. But you see, the integral overall is exactly that limit. So in that case, the limit still exists and still gives the correct integral. So, so we don't really even need any condition on the integrand. It's just the fact that we know that all the pieces converge in advance. And we know it by that main assumption, right? That main assumption that we started with is what guarantees the finiteness of all of the integrals. And that, that was true both on the x-axis where we integrated on these pieces, but it's also true on the y-axis for all the pieces on the y-axis, like this. Because remember that we just, uh, we achieve those by u substitutions, by making a change of variables from x to y. And those changes of variables were legitimate in every single case. So yeah, um, it's, it's correct to basically re-express this limit of, of an integral in this way, even in the case where this integral is improper at one of its two ends. Okay, so the fact that it can only be improper at one of the ends is crucial. And the fact that it's known to converge already in advance is crucial. But because of that, it's legitimate. And so, yeah, that checks off this step and it completes the argument. Okay, so you see what we've um, done here is a very long calculation, but we started way back <coughs> with, with the assumption the main assumption, which was simply that this integral here converges. And the conclusion we got is that this integral here also converges, at least when g is chosen properly. So remember that um, you have a choice about a density. You can always change its values on a discrete set. <coughs> we have to change it accordingly to make it um, be given by that you know, fancy summation formula. But it is still a legitimate density because changing it on a discrete set keeps it Riemann equivalent. Anyway, so that also converges, and uh, the two integrals are actually equal. Okay, now because this side is therefore the expected value, remember g is just the density, or a density, of our new random variable, phi of x hat. And so therefore this integral here implies the expectability of that new random variable, and it also is equal to the expected value of it. But then the other integral is too. So you see, all we needed was the convergence of this. And that guarantees everything we want. It guarantees the